Welcome to Digital Oil and Gas with Jeffrey Can. I'm Jeffrey. Digital Oil and Gas looks at the impact of digital technology on the global oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Can on Twitter or at jeffreycan.com. Welcome back to another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. My name's Jeffrey and I'm the host of uh, the podcast. But uh, today I'm joined by Bobby Mason, who is the CEO and president of Spock Automation. Bobby, welcome to Digital Oil and Gas. Jeffrey, it is a pleasure to be here. It's also an honor to be here and I am just thrilled to, for the opportunity. Uh, and so anyone listening to this, uh, Bobby, will pick up from your accent that you're, 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 you're not from Canada. <laughs> so where, whereabouts are you based? We are based in the Birmingham, Alabama area. Uh, got I, our start in coal bed methane, so that's why oil and gas guy is uh, down in Alabama. Now, which, which, which coal bed methane uh, basins were you prosecuting? Was that in the, um, the, the Powder River area or some other part of the United States? Well, the uh, Black Warrior Basin actually is only about 45 minutes uh, to the west of our location. Oh, really? And that's one of the areas where coal bed methane actually got started 25 or so years ago. I had no idea. I've spent my time in coal bed methane. In, it was in Australia. It was called coal seam gas uh, or CSG. Um, pr- pr- probably very similar in in uh, in, in uh, basin characteristics. The Australian basins are waterlogged, so they they have to be dewatered before the gas will flow. Um, in in Alberta, the basins are dry. There's no water, so the gas flows pretty quickly. What, what, what was it? What was the characteristics of the basin you were in? It was actually wet, and it was the dewatering application that we got uh, the company started oh. uh, coming up with some solutions on rod pumps uh, using our variable frequency drive technology. Hmm. And uh, then we applied that beyond the CBM world into the, the oil side of business and, and that kind of dominated. Right on. Uh, so it's, uh, it just re- reminds me sometimes how small oil and gas, <laughs> the oil and gas world actually is, although the, the basins are um, as individual as children. Um, the reality is they often have quite common characteristics, and, and so that's an interesting one. So that answers the com- probably my first question was where and how did you get started in the industry? Um, but what <clears throat> what what brought you to um, work on on and, and create this company, Spock Automation? What what problems were you trying to solve that you saw as as uh, something worth devoting your professional life towards? No, it is a, a interesting story, and it's a combination of not only solving customer issues, uh, but it was also a personal issue. We uh, had come up with the solution in the to to ha- apply a variable frequency drive, which is a digital controller versus an on-off motor starter um, on rod pumps without using. Uh, resistors, dynamic braking brake choppers and resistors. And that technology allowed us to pick up a 25 to 40 percent, depending on the application, uh, energy saving per well site. Wow. Which was pretty amazing. And then it also allowed us to, the name Spock is an acronym for sensorless pump off control. So by not having that brake chopper and resistor in the circuit, it allowed us better control of the AC motor and allowed us to actually develop a pump-off controller that resided inside the drive. And we had been solving this, had several thousand units out at a former uh, company that my father owned. And he sold that company, and we had a difference of philosophy on culture. Um, They really wanted to focus on uh, MRO type things, and we were an automation house. Uh, And so we we were doing uh, automation systems. We did a control system, a jackup rig in the North Sea. We did automation systems all over in various, various industries, uh, as well as uh, the oil and gas industry. 
and because of that difference, um, about 20 years ago, I turned in my notice after they asked me to start letting our engineering talent go. Mm. And I walked in my dad's office and said, I, I can't work for these people anymore. It's not right what they're doing. And uh, it's not good business sense either. So we took this this application and technology and talked with our customers and uh, we left and started Spock and it was seven of us initially and then we have grown it into one of the largest drive suppliers in this space in the in the nation. That's an amazing story. Uh, the um, w- w- what was the composition of the team that you you brought with you? Was it uh, R and D specialists or technicians or? What it was engineering. Uh, that that was the the people that I had to hand pink, pink slips out to mm. were engineering and uh, automation techs. Uh, they wanted to get out of that business, and so we uh, handed them pink slips, and I asked them to wait till uh, January because this was right before Christmas. Oh yeah, uh, all, all the lawyers were on vacation, and and then we uh, we incorporated. And we left, and uh, we've been very blessed ever since. And we've come up with a tremendous amount of solutions and technology and partnered with some of the best people in the industry. Well, you mentioned um, that the, the, there's a digital element to um, <clears throat> the, the product set, but you, it sounds like even back then you were visualizing a, uh, uh, that, that, that the future would feature a, a more digital uh, innovation. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit. Like, what, what did you? What were you watching back then that, that led you to conclude that there was an innovation opportunity here? Well, traditionally, all rotating equipment, which is really our specialty, anything with an electric motor on rotating equipment, so pumps, compressors, etc., hmm. we would start those up traditionally with an across the line starter. So you had an on off switch, somebody would hit the push button and they start their equipment. Well, that start has a seven to 12 times the full load rating of the motor on inrush. Well, that's a huge, that sets your peak demand charges. Uh, it, it also increases your utility rate each month and with a digital solution, you eliminated that inrush, and you get the additional benefit using a variable frequent, a variable speed or variable frequency drive. It's interchangeable, the, the terminology. It allowed you to change speed and torque characteristics of the motor without mechanically changing shivs and pulleys and all the other things. Well. That set the platform because a drive has so many sensors in it that it allows you better control. It allows you to do things you couldn't do before. Now you're doing electronic control versus mechanical control on speed. And and I can bring all of that data back through a SCADA system, which we also have a a SCADA company as an element of of this company, or we talk to anyone else's SCADA equipment. So now... It gave you the ability to start and stop remotely, bring in field devices, pressures, analogs, uh, digitals, discretes, all of those field inputs and automate a system. Well, if we could take all of that and we have the ability to program the drive like a controller, now I can take an individual process, a machine, and I can automate it, not only save energy, but I can increase production through making intelligent decisions. And I just saw that as the future uh, of where all industries should go. Mm-hmm. And, and certainly in oil and gas, I mean, the, the, uh, you know, the, the drive to um, improving production levels has always been a, a critical uh, success factor. Uh, it's, it's always much cheaper to <clears throat> extract a bit more from a well than it ever is to drill a new one. And uh, so the the uh, I, I can certainly see that as a critical driver. Um, how how does that translate now into a if you can kind of 
pull forward from that time of, of vision. How, how does that translate now into um, the t- today's world of, of digital, you know, which features more much higher levels of automation, cloud computing, uh, more focus on data and, and the like. How, how does this now translate into a different world for you? Well, we are on our second generation uh, variable frequency drive technology today. Mm. And I'm extremely excited about the third generation that we're going to be introducing to the market um, first quarter of next year. And what it, what it equates to is more computing power at the machine level. So the Internet of Things is coming to the oil field at the machine level, which to me is is a great place to start. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the next generation drives have more sensors in them. Uh, they have the ability to, uh, for instance, if a customer... I think this is very beneficial, the data. Big data seems to be a buzzword everywhere, but big data is just that. If it's not usable data, then it's not beneficial to you. But if you have the ability to do some machine learning at the, at the pump or compressor, at that, at that location, bring data in, for instance, let's just say hypothetically, we were talking about motor data. If I could see that your electric motor was operating at a certain speed under a certain load condition um, under a certain hertz frequency Mm -hmm. and I knew the life expectancy of that motor based on sensors in in the drive then I could give you intelligent information that would say this motor has a life expectancy of let's just say 24 months at these parameter sets, how you're operating the equipment. And then if I slow down by one hertz, just slow it down one hertz, it it might extend the life of that equipment, that motor, uh, by who knows, maybe that's 29 months, maybe that's 32 months. It, it will vary based on load and all those things. However, if I do have that technology built into the drive, what if I could then tell you premature failure of that motor is going to occur in 24 months. So at 20 months, you get an output that says to your system, we need to order a 75 horsepower motor for this rod pump or this ESP or whatever the application is. Because you're going to have a, a, a projected failure. So now you're being proactive instead of reactive and you don't order material too far in advance, but you have it where you can actually schedule maintenance instead of being reactionary. Say it's on a saltwater disposal and now you've got to shut in your whole field because the prime mover Mm -hmm. is down. Those type things we see as the future at the machine level of big data being pushed all the way down. And that that reality is, is here. So that uh, the, the way to think about that edge device, if you like, that pump controller. What I hear you articulating is is it that that um, uh, you know, many many uh, that that uh, the machine, if you like, will be able to uh, learn at the edge rather than. Uh, programming it once in a in a in a shop somewhere, putting it to site, and then letting it run within its set points. Um, it's it's learning all the time about um, and 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 adapting itself to its current conditions. Is that that's the way to think about this, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Which is uh, which is exactly what we've been doing for years in the process control side of things. Mm. And that's actually what our pump off controller does. It constantly learns and adapts based on well conditions. But now that's actually being pushed into external external equipment of around the machine. Now, why is it why is it hard to do uh, out into the into the sort of this external um, setting? I mean, part part of it is you know there's no network out there. It's the conditions, the operating conditions are you know much more variable, heat and temperature and, and the like. But, but you know, are there are there other things that that make this particularly thorny a problem to try and solve? Environmental issues, and you're also now, you have to be scalable uh, because it's not a big system bringing in 
all of these things. It's a simple system, mm. on a single pumping application. It's a distributed control system is basically what it is. Yep. That has the capability then to pass data upstream to your your business system or your SCADA system or whatever whatever mechanism that you want to collect that data from the field. Now these these um, uh, pumps in the in the field are often don't actually have the connectivity that you know we all experience in our more day to day lives in in built up urban areas. How does the the either the Lack of network connectivity, or the uh, or the the sporadic uh, connectivity, influence how you think about this or architect these solutions for for the field. Well, the great part about that is there are industry standards, and um, Modbus or Modbus uh, is is one. Yep. Ethernet. Uh, all of those standards are generally typical protocols that are that are used in the industry to talk to your RTUs uh, and the drives communicate through, we've got different cards for all the different uh, industrial platforms and protocols. So we can talk to just about any device that is out there. Um, that that challenge is, is not nearly as big a challenge as it was 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, and at that time, you know, the design of, of a walled garden model was 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 quite common and, and had the effect of you're trapped into a single vendor's uh, construct and architecture, and that led to higher costs. And um, now, on the other hand, uh, very very reliable performance, but but uh, oftentimes, you know, didn't give the flexibility to allow the uh, field uh, designs to uh, take advantage of the very best available technology of the day. And that's now solved um, because of these these more plug and play and, and uh, uh, protocols that allow the integration across different different devices. What's uh, if you think about the the kind of the the future? You've talked about your know, next generation. Um, you know where where is that where is that headed, and how does that connect up, or how does it relate to this uh, industry 4.0 movement that is um, again more akin to manufacturing, but uh, it appears to be uh, at least starting to inform the conversation about what oil and gas should be should be doing. Well. That's a that's a great question, and we're super super excited about the next generation drive, it, the, the abilities that it's going to have, smaller packages. But one of the things that we have available that I think is super super exciting about uh, pushing this industry into the next generation of alternatives is uh, around using our technology and software in the drives as a uh, grid converter or energy storage uh, device. Hmm. And when I say that, a, a drive, a variable frequency drive is the perfect solution for converting power. So if you, if you think about it, alternative energy sources and energy storage systems need a way to Bridge, uh, I'll just say a router, so to speak. Um, you've got utility power, maybe you've got battery, uh, back uh, a battery bank there, or, or capacitors to run that that application in the loss of uh, of you of energy. Maybe there's solar or generator, whatever alternative energy is available would give you then the flexibility, the drive can act as just like a router would on, on data, it can do that with, with energy, with power. So now I can have multiple feeds coming into the drive and the drive have the intelligence to be able to shift. So maybe I need uh, to do peak shaving, uh, you hit, three o'clock in, in the afternoon and your peak demand charges go up because everybody comes home and they're turning on their air conditioning units. And so the utility charges you a peak demand charge. Well, what mm. if you could shave uh, off of the grid and go to an alternative source, whether that be battery backup for, for emergency use or an alternative energy source? 
uh, generator or wind or solar or whatever that may be. Time shifting, which is where you can you can shift and pick the lowest cost energy to get your lift done uh, and, and switch it around based on what is the lowest cost at that particular time of operation. And then of course, energy storage where you're, where you're constantly using the drive to charge your, your backup power uh, and, and switch between these. So we're really, really excited about this capability of using our power converters in in uh, in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's going to be enormous interest in this uh, innovation uh, as the the uh, there are increasing pressures on organizations to either factor in carbon pricing or carbon costs into their day to day, and and to be able to uh, you know have a machine uh, flex to power supply based on price or uh, current uh, network capacity or even weather patterns uh, will be uh, critical if we, uh, in, industrially, we want to uh, uh, achieve a, um, a higher performance from our electrical consuming devices you know, in a carbon constrained world. So that's really powerful. And so that extends well beyond just um, you know, the, the operations of, of pumps in the field, I would imagine. Absolutely. It, that is a that is a solution that that can help you not only on critical load, uh, but really help you in your operations. And and so we're we're really excited about the the future mm. and the ability actually to reshape the industry. Yeah, uh, and give people options that they did not know existed in the past. Will this uh, will this t- uh, will this uh, potentially take you um, into adjacent industry s- uh, segments? Do you think? It is. It's it's actually technology that has already been deployed quite a bit in the marine industry. Marine. Uh, yes, in in uh, work boats out in the Gulf. We we actually got uh, we've got a lot of replacement of diesel engine. So if you think about it, they're constantly running diesel engines on on those work boats, mm-hmm. and they got to be available to give you full load. Well, what if you could switch and and have a variable frequency drive running your your main propulsion and your bow thrusters, uh, and then only ramp up the generation when needed. So it cuts their fuel consumption immensely mm. and reduces their emissions because they're not running those uh, generators full out all the time. All the time, yeah. It's a bit like modern car technology. You pull up to the stoplight and the engine switches off. Um, and But yet it's instantly available the minute you need the, the thrust. Uh, that is, you put your foot back on the accelerator, uh, your engine is instantly there. Every one of those there. cars has an inverter in it. That's, that's exactly it. Is, is the, the electric car has a, an inverter in it. It's, an, it's, a, it's a drive, which mm-hmm. is exactly we're using that technology. Yeah. It's a variable frequency. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of applications for this. I was interviewing a uh, on an earlier podcast. Another application was in the fracking uh, world and well completions. Uh, they um, at a, at a <clears throat> fracking site there'll be a lot of horsepower on standby to to drive the uh, fracking activity and um, and and when they're in when they're in full when they're full throat you know they're they're, they're working pretty hard but anytime there's some some downtime or an unproductive time those engines don't shut off they just they just sit there and idle and uh, you know, creating an emissions issue but more importantly it's the wear and tear on the equipment it's a reduction in oper- uh, operating hours. And uh, so this innovation was, well, is there a way to swing this, uh, the, these engines on and off in the same way that the auto industry does this so as to reduce, reduce uh, keep the capacity available, but, but have it on dramatically reduced um, footprint of, of uh, actual fuel consumption? Um, it wasn't really driven around emissions as much as it was around uh, fuel consumption and wear and tear, but similar, similar concept. There'll be a lot of engines and motors like this all around the oil and gas industry. A- absolutely. Absolutely. So, so we're at, at, in the um, in the uh, sort of a longer range um, uh, look for this. Uh, are you picking up any 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 um, interest internationally? I, I, I'm on my side certainly. I'm, I'm feeling 
calls constantly now uh, internationally where international markets are very interested to learn what North Americans are up to because it's such a creative, um, the economies here are so creative. Are you sensing the same thing, international interest in this sort of thing? Yes, we are. We, we are seeing an uptick in our international uh, opportunities uh, as well as orders. Uh, there, there is uh, there's still a lot of activity going on out there and yeah. they are very interested in ways to do it that are efficient um, and, and quite frankly, uh, the best available technology that's out there. Mm. What uh, what kind of barriers stand in the way of uptake here? Is it uh, is it uh, culture or is it uh, just in lack of understanding of what this kind of technology can do? The beauty of it is that the technology has been around for quite a while. Mm. It's the software that allows you to do it. So we we're hit the the technology is of inverters and drives has been around for for decades. Huh. And is a we're we're in the stages where initially when inverter technology came out it was not very reliable and it was very very expensive and and extremely large so i.e. think of computing yep uh, and then we have increased stability we have increased the the robustness and industrialization of the products over the decades. And today, it is uh, it is a huge, huge business that has uh, extremely good products out there. And the differentiation today in that is the software, the abilities there, and then the packaging for the harsh environment. That's that's something that's underplayed in in any electronic, and and that's really what we're dealing with, is applying electronics out in some of the harshest conditions on the planet. And so you. You have to account for heat and, and cold. You, you need to have uh, surge suppression and, and be available to take care of uh, transient voltage and, and lightning and all the other things that we face every day in this industry. In the field, Joe. Uh, if you don't package it correctly, uh, it will not last. Yeah. Well, it's an important uh, takeaway, actually, is, is you have to think very holistically about about solutions for this industry. I know a lot of tech entrepreneurs who, uh, you know, have some great concept or some great idea, but they they, they haven't they 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 uh, the the idea of a minimally viable solution for oil and gas actually <laughs> encompasses a great deal more uh, capability because of the need for fail safe, you know, the need for reliability, these harsh conditions, and uh, so good product launches are are those that that. Um, try to embrace a bigger perspective of the environment rather than the smaller, more simple one that you typically see in the consumer world. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So, uh, so good upside. Um, I, technology has been in the market for for a lengthy period of time. It's well understood. Uh, th there's enough drivers, though, starting to compel um, a deeper investigation and understanding of where and how this could work, uh, which is creating a uh, uh, sounds like a, a positive uplift. Do, do, are you finding the pandemic environment is 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 having a uh, an effect on demand in in that uh, is one 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 way to think about that I suppose is equipment that runs more reliably in the field requires less hands on to uh, to 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 uh, um, supervise it or repair it and maintain it and that therefore is a positive when it comes to the pandemic. But just curious if if any of your customers are reporting. You know, this is a, a tool to help them uh, during this current um, health crisis. We've had quite a, uh, we actually started a, an interesting little um, program we call Build Up, and, and it's an external program that we did during the pandemic that hmm. my team came up with. And we, we have these little, these little videos, we call them two minute drives. And uh, unfortunately, uh, holding to two minutes is hard. So some of them might go as long as three and a half or, or so. <laughs> in general, everybody tried to, to hold to that two-minute promise. Yep. Um, and they picked different topics. And we had engineers, field service guys. We had uh, management team members. We had just a bunch of people. I think they put out about 30 or 35 so far. And they were giving out intellectual property and gifts to people to try to help them 
uh, reduce their cost. You know, basic blocking and tackling things, frequently asked questions mm -hmm. that we could solve with videos. We post them on our website as well as uh, we did email blast out to our, our customer lists. And, and one of the charges that I've given my engineers actually since uh, since we started doing these these type products and projects is we take an iPhone approach towards automation. Have you ever read the manual for your iPhone? <laughs> is there a manual for an iPhone? I, I'm, I know there is. I'm just I'm joking. You you can you can, but who does that? Who who bothers? Yeah, you're you're exactly right. So we've yeah. taken a a very high tech automation piece of equipment. We put an operator interface on it. It's a touch screen, and we take that. My engineers are charged with trying to make it like an iPhone in that if you understand your application, whether that's a a PC pump, a rod pump, a, a saltwater disposal, whatever, a compressor. They build out the screens so that it is so intuitive that you almost don't need a manual. Now, mm. you, you do need a manual because there's safety precautions to make sure you're getting torque specs correctly and yep. wiring things up correct and all. But, but we try to take the intimidation out of automation mm. through our interface to the customer. Our next generation drive, I'm so excited. Uh, we're going to we're going to launch our HPS series drive first um, for, for saltwater disposal control. Right. And that product we took it took 50, we had a total of 54 screens in the current generation, and we've taken that down to eight. And we're constantly trying to improve the product. So now you can set up an entire uh, H-pump system on eight screens and be running and have all the data available to you and you're, you're rocking and rolling. Wow. So I am, I'm just super, super proud of, of the job that my team has put together um, That's trying to make the intimidation and, and that factor because we're all working with less people nowadays. Yeah. Uh, and, and so the more that operator has available to him in ease of use, we feel like is the, an advantage for our customers. Yeah, there's, uh, there is a, uh, a, a, a history at the, in this industry of building technology much less with the human operator in mind and more um, aimed at the nuances of the hardware. And, um, but, but uh, there's that, I, I sense this tide is shifting. People are, tech, tech companies in particular, suppliers, are, are now coming to realize that easy to use technology that is very quick to uptake uh, generates a rabid fans, even amongst oil and gas professionals. And it's a, it's a huge win for all, all around, actually. So well done there. We, that's, that's part of our, uh, design criteria to get a voice of customer input and, yep. and show customers yep. in, in beta and, and get that feedback to try to get it as as user friendly as possible. Yeah. Well, I hate to say this, but we are at the end of our time uh, together, Bobby. I wanted to thank you very much for coming on to the uh, podcast today and sharing what Spock Automation is up to in the world of uh, variable drives and the future of a, a smarter uh, edge drives that, that are self-managed. So thank you very much for taking the time today. It was my pleasure, and if I can ever be of assistance or answer any questions, I'm on LinkedIn as uh, Robert L. Mason, and, and you can always visit our website at spockautomation.com. That's S-P-O-C automation.com. Yep, Spock, not the Star Trek Spock, S-P-O-C. <laughs> That's it. That's, we actually have some great T-shirts made up that are uh, pump long and proper. Right on. All right, Bobby, thank you very much. Thank you. This has been another episode of Digital Oil and Gas. And if you like what you've heard, by all means, press uh, one of the many buttons to like, comment, or share this content so that your network can find it. And I'll return next week with another episode. Bye for now. <laughs>